Hello, and uh, hello, and welcome to the In Common Writers series here at the Poetry Center. Uh, the series is supported by the Walter and Elise Haas Fund, and we want to thank them for the support for us to bring these writers together. I'm Carlos Quinteros, and I'll be your MC for the evening. Uh, tonight, we are delighted to present to you John Yao and Andrew Joran. We will begin with a reading by each reader, a uh, writer, sorry, and then bring in both John and Andrew for some conversation and questions asked by the audience throughout the reading. Um, and, and we will be providing live captioning 
for this event, which will be posted in the chat. Thank you all for joining us and let's get started. Um, Andrew Jaron is the author of The Absolute Letter, a collection of poems published by Flood Editions in 2017. He has several other poetry collections as well as published translations from German. He plays the theremin in various experimental and free jazz ensembles. You heard the, uh, you heard the quartet Cloud Shepherd as our opening music tonight, which Andrew is a member of. He also teaches creative writing here at SF State. So please welcome Andrew Joran. Hi, hi everybody. So glad to be here. Am I coming through, Carlos? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so glad to be here and especially thrilled to be reading with John Yao. Uh, John Yao and I have known each other for like something like 30 years, um, which is a significant chunk of time in anyone's life, uh, but we've rarely had a chance to read together. So. Uh, thank you to Steve Dickinson and the Poetry Center for providing this opportunity. Um, yeah, I, I just want to tell a quick anecdote about how John and I met uh, all those years ago. Uh, I was trying to find my way out of science fiction. Uh, that's where I got my start as a writer um, and reading, starting to read experimental poets uh, of whom uh, John was one. Uh, so when my book uh, of, of poems entitled Science Fiction came out in the early 90s, I sent John a copy and I sent a fan letter and he wrote back and um, said he was coming out to, to Berkeley to teach. Uh, so he got here, he, you know, he lives in New York City. He's, you know, he, he's um, uh, an important figure on the New York uh, poetry and, and art scene. So, but he came out to Berkeley for a while to teach and we hung out and we've hung out ever since. And we share all kinds of interests, including surrealism and science fiction. So reading with him today is, feels like a closing of the circle of my whole itinerary as a writer. Um, uh, I started out, in, like I said, in science fiction, went into surrealism, experimental poetry, and here I am back doing science fiction again. Um, although a science fiction marked by my passage through surrealism and experimental poetry. So what I'm gonna do tonight is read um, a couple of poems and then a chapter from uh, a forthcoming science fiction book. Um, so that, uh, this is a new poem uh, that's not yet collected in any book. And the title is emanate, emanate. It's a verb, um, could also be a license plate, maybe someday, I'll have to check if anyone has that. Um, emanate, stand before a mirror and you become a member of another world stand behind a name and the world becomes a member of itself. So make a map of all the eyes you've ever met. Find a path through the mirrors of thine others. Continuity is the essence of the abyss. To radiate, leave it all behind. To emanate, stay connected to the source. Wave phantom, the ship of state, who cares who carries, who cures, write your answer here on the most reflective surface. Dear observer, as space expands, never is misspelled as nerver. So the mind is blinded by perception. So reading is reanimation of the dead. Okay, and this next poem, which was published in the book that Carlos mentioned, the absolute letter. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen so you can see the text uh, since there's a bit of sound play happening here. Um, this poem, as you can see, is entitled The Phrases of the Moon. Full, the blow to a gong gone blind with the sight of white silk, O oh milk of my reason, sun reseen in my mad, mad mirror. Gibbous, sense less science, the wish apparition of a perfect fact, as thought the war of one upon one. Half, half a mind almost mine, 
whole fragment. I am a being from another word. Crescent, bow bent back to what release? My lone line, the join of all I am not. A minor truth betrays a major one, a lore for the liar. For it is written, liar with a Y. New, calling all coincidence, I will deem the dark my day. Yet, if I say, I am lying, I am lying to you now. O zero, raised to zero, I am lying with you now. Okay, uh, that was the phrases of the moon from the absolute letter. And um, now I'd like to read uh, a short chapter uh, from my forthcoming science fiction book, uh, the title of this book. I know I could probably do this in chat, but I love holding up these signs. It's like intertitles in a, in a silent movie. So the title of the book is O0, the letter O and the number zero. Um, and uh, if I have time after reading this short chapter, I'll, I'll, um, I'll read a couple more poems. We'll, we'll see what the time looks like. Um, but I, I sort of have to set it up for you. Uh, otherwise you won't understand what's happening in this chapter. And probably my, uh, my framing the chapter is gonna take almost as long as reading the chapter itself because it's a, a bit of a complicated story. But here goes. So the premise of the book is our universe is colliding with a neighboring universe and the point of impact happens to lie in the vicinity of our solar system. Uh, now this neighboring universe that's colliding with ours is older and bigger with laws of nature vastly different from ours. So that reality, especially in the space around Earth, is being distorted. In fact, Earth has disappeared into the folds of space-time around the collision point. In its place, a distorted parody of Earth has appeared called Ocean One. Ocean One is populated by a race of mutant dolphins called delphins because they resemble elves as well as being dolphins. Now, the fact that our universe has collided with another has been noticed by an ancient race of disembodied intelligences that dwell in the Omega Nebula, hundreds of light years away. This elder race constructs a mile long spaceship, uh, actually a space whale named Lorca. Oh, and here's, um, this is the, the, uh, the way that Lorca spells her name. Uh, she looks like a killer whale, albeit a, a mile long, uh, Lorca. Um, so uh, they've constructed the space whale named Lorca to go investigate the collision. Lorca is actually the main character of the story, but in the short chapter I'm going to read, we see only her dead carcass immersed in Ocean One, being explored by a rebel delphin named Moo. Moo. Lorca has been caught in a time loop and comes back to life later in the story. But this chapter is told from the rebel Delphin Moon's point of view. Okay, here we go. The planetoid Ocean One, in violation of the laws of physics, was nothing but a single drop of water orbiting the sun. Watery down to its very core, Mu, the young Delphin, recited the lesson obsessively, for it provided a picture of her soul today, watery, down to its very core. The lesson on water continued. If one is incapable of holding any shape, then one is empty. What was wrong with this reasoning? Mu had committed mirror assassination, the worst crime imaginable. The crime left no evidence but an empty mirror. Now she too felt herself to be empty, a predictable consequence, and forever alienated from the society of delphins swarming in their millions through the warrens of Asia, a spherical mountain that rolled in the depths of Ocean One. She had committed the crime without premeditation. Indeed, the crime could only be a spontaneous act carried out in a flash of blind sight. Yet in retrospect, she knew with certainty that she had intended to do it. How, she wondered as she swam into the ancient wreck known as Space, space Whale, could an act be both spontaneous and intentional. The gigantic carcass had become her place of refuge, away from the constant bloom and zoom of the Delphin city. She had come here often in the days leading up to the crime. To meditate, she had told herself, 
to receive messages from the origin of the world. Mu had, to the mild disapproval of her family, become fascinated by the ancestral trash caught up in the wake of Asia. The greatest relic of them all was space whale. What message had she received from it? Along the interior walls of space whale, fingers of iridescence followed Mu, always falling short of her shadow as it crept over the technoid outcroppings. Mu was not afraid, having become accustomed to conditions inside the relic. Who, she called softly, who, who? In the aftermath of her crime, it comforted her to invoke the name of the first Delphin to step out of his own reflection. Who, of course, could not protect her now. She would be pursued. The symmetry keepers would know where to find her. Mu slipped easily through the dear old petrified bones. She imagined herself to be space whale, alive and plunging through far away red nebulae. Mu had never seen the stars. She had never swum to the surface to breach that utter, utterly smooth, waveless ceiling and gaze for one freezing instant at the sun. Those who had done so, scientists and mystics for the most part, returned with their faces blackened, spiritual light spilling from their mouths. It was not a crime to breach the surface, to witness the wheels of heaven, to confirm what was already attested in the sacred records, was to uphold the shimmering O whose mirror face was zero. Who said that? Only the violation of symmetry was a crime. Because of Mu's rash deed, one of heaven's wheels was, mess was missing now. Mu felt its absence, even here, inside the beloved carcass of space whale. They would find her here. They would take her back to Asia, imprison her, gently but without forgiveness, in a tesseract. Desperately, she sought some small item, some souvenir of space whale that would, could keep her company, succor her as she languished for a lifetime in that cell. But this mile-long tunnel contained nothing but the remnants of life machinery. There, what was that? A shiny orb lodged in a crevice. She pried it loose. It fit perfectly in the palm of her hand. It weighed almost nothing, but felt heavy nonetheless. It had somehow escaped petrifaction. She clutched the orb to her chest as if Space Whale had gifted it to her. Best to leave now, return to the city. Mu did not want the symmetry keepers to break into Space Whale in order to apprehend her. The relic's interior had become identical to Mu's own, a thought cavern where she concocted stories without characters or events. She did not wish to see this place invaded by the police. Mu waited as usual for the fingers of iridescence to point toward an exit, never the same one. This time they showed her a spiral-shaped spiral sphincter near the head of the relic. Thank you, she whispered, worming her way out, out, out into the world ocean and all the wild wave action of Asia's detritus trail. Mu clung to space whale's hull for a moment. Ocean was warm and good to breathe after the stale effluvium trapped in the carcass's entrails. Daylight flickered down from surface, dappling the hull. Miles ahead rolled the great round rock of Asia, home of Delphin humanity, a played out utopia, a prison house for Mu. Why not seek refuge in one of the other great rocks, America, Africa, Ost, or Arctica? They were all uninhabited now, but she would have to journey far to reach them, and she would probably die of starvation along the way. Besides, the scent of her crime, like the taste of space whales effluvium, lingered in her. She wanted to purge herself of her own poison, make an obscene bubble of it that would explode in the face of her captors. Perhaps she needed to take other actions, corollary to the crime. Mu pushed herself away from space whale's pitted and corroded body. She needed to dive sideways, tacking across the turbulence of the wake toward stiller water. Carrying the orb, she swam awkwardly. Its weight, or lack of weight, steered her the wrong way. In fact, it seemed to be pulling her deeper than she wanted to go. As Mu struggled with it, she realized she had already passed beyond the wake more quickly than usual, thanks to the orb. Now in calmer currents, the orb, as if sensing her intent, veered back toward the rolling rock of Asia. What a strange device she'd plucked from the innards of Space Whale. It was helping her to get back to Asia in half the usual time. Yet no delight or wonder stirred in her, only a grim gray gratitude. Once she entered the city, 
she would seek out the symmetry keepers, surrender herself to them. Why not? She had cut herself off from the rest of humanity. Nothing mattered now. Yes, it was all that mattered, this new vacancy, this lack of feeling she felt inside her. She would sit on the floor of her cell, the orb placed before her, and think upon nothing. Mu had lost the precepts, the guides to good action that she was born with. She had always known they were poorly formulated, even fallacious, when set against the night of time. Rather than devise a better set of precepts, she preferred to have none. She remembered the day she'd first emerged, fully formed, along with her sisters, Lu, Su, Fu, Ru, Bu, in the form of birth mirror, in the in the room of birth mirrors. She remembered crying with them, not again, never again, but a voice of wavering presence within their mirrors, who, who, showed the little brood of sisters how to overcome this primary aversion. All of them were reconciled to re-existence, all except Mu. Not long after, her sisters went who who hooing through the corridors of Asia, ready to assume their positions in society. Only Mu hung back, lingering near her birth mirror. She had emerged at a different angle, a fallen angle. She could have been a child, a type of unformed human that no longer existed, but a child cognizant of the history of the world and wanting to play dangerously with it. Who said, don't. But his voice must be, she reasoned deviously, mirror reversed. So Mu heard do Mu and also doom. She was shaken from her reverie by a downward yank of the orb. She was nearing home, close enough that the city no longer looked spherical, but flat. Below her spread a landscape of wells and windows. She heard the groan, the ground tone of Asia's progress through the waters. Once more, she had to battle turbulence, her sleek naked delphin body slicing artfully through the heavy waves. It was likely that she would never again swim freely in ocean. She didn't care. Mu grabbed a handhold next to a public window. The window's membrane knew her as delphin and allowed her to slip inside. Um, and that's the end of that chapter. Um, if I've got a little more time, and, and tell me if not, I'll read one more poem. Okay, I'm gonna go for this one more poem. Um, and this poem uh, happens to be dedicated to John Yao. Uh, it was written many years ago, back in the 90s for my book, The Removes. Uh, and it's the title of the poem is Anima Macula for John Yao. Rift inhuman as signature's chosen accident thins to a trickle almost enough to identify or bring to term her name alone. X looms inside that orb of shadow, translates the color of Flatland's missing dimension. Just so a page is turned, geometric field of the patriarch, surveilling cell whose walls are permeable and blessed with wounds. Her letter exfoliant there as if darkly aflame, lit this vertical, this veridical eye, candle and echolalia paired to its pulsing root, declines, st star-like to late nature, the history of signs choked with intervals of ecstatic doubt. Okay, you know, I'm gonna end with that. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Andrew, that was incredible. Appreciate you being here and reading that. All right, so up next we have John Yao. John Yao is a poet, fiction writer, critic, editor, curator, and publisher of Black Square Editions, a small independent press that has published books and broadsides of poetry, fiction, criticism, and translation, as well as prints. John is author of over 40 books, his most recent publication being a collection of poetry, Bijous in the Dark, published by Letter Machine Editions in 2018. He is a professor of critical studies at Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University. Please welcome here at the Poetry Center on a rare West Coast visit, John Yao. Mute. All right, can you hear me? 
Am I doing this right? Yep, we can hear you, John. All right, that was great to hear uh, Andrew read from his novel. Um, I will read from a book that's gonna come out in um, 2021, 2021, uh, from On the Dawn which I believe is in Berkeley, California. So I will return in another way, I guess, next year. And the book is called um, Genghis Chan on Drums. Um, so I'm just going to read poems from that. I hope you can see me. Okay. After I turn 68, I find distasteful ways to use the words enduring and hopeful, I begin stockpiling my daily doses of radiation in an abandoned dollhouse. I order crystals from male order spiritual specialists and bury them in the front yard. I start telling my neighbors that I'm interested in marrying an older mermaid. I ask a coworker if it's unsanitary to sneeze and from my unwashed armpits, I confess to the druggist that the condoms are from my besotted dog. I tell the taxi driver that I was lucky to have escaped from the morgue. I shrug my shoulders and pretend that I don't know what you're saying. I ask people if they've seen any strange pedestrians wandering around, dazed. I carry a toy phone under my arm and talk into it whenever I go outside. I once told my psychiatrist that I speak gibberish in four different languages. I pretend that I'm a poet interested in discarded library books and obscure rhymes. I always sign the guest book with three X's because growing old is pornographic. I'm gonna read uh, the next few poems are from a series that's ongoing. It's called Opinion Sonnets. Uh, they were originally started based on threads uh, I found on the internet about being Chinese, well, or what people thought being Chinese was, is. Opinion Sonnet 13. Don't, and it has a little Epigraph. Don't blame bat soup for the Wuhan virus. They don't just gobble down four legged and two legged creatures. They slurp slime depositing life forms residing on pond bottoms. They bury their eggs in dirt dug up from children's graveyards. They make broth for dumpling soup from bones of rabid dogs. They scrape donkey hides and turn the piles of pickings into youth jelly. They rub bird droppings into dark crevices in pursuit of yellow beauty. They refuse to change their names to soft letters that roll off the tongue. They hide others among them that harbor torrents of bad and ugly feelings. They claim their ancestors were inventors when there were farmers crouching, crouching in mud. They concoct history so fantastical that not even small children believe them. They, they invented fireworks, noodles, and kung fu, which hardly adds up to a civilization. They openly sneeze and snicker about it, then scatter like mice. They're nothing more than scribbled names on the flyleaf of a tattered book. They might make good sneakers, but they're sneakier than snakes. Opinion Sonnet 15. We're not talking about Asians. We're talking about China. It's a smart business to name a restaurant chain after a cuddly bear who happens to be a vegetarian. But it's another thing to go big game hunting in the African savanna. I would just as soon turn a panda into a huggy coat or hat, importing kudu horns or making a zebra into a rug. This is real and different. For one thing, it's permanent, not just a bowl of green weeds and brown meat scraps gobble wolf to slurped up or jammed down with sticks. 
standing beside a dead giraffe that you shot on a hot day proves something about the depth of your character. I respect a man or woman that displays big game trophies. We had Teddy Roosevelt, his big stick policy and rough riders. What does China have? Old men with canes and fallen zippers. Opinion Sonnet 22. Official instructions. Condolences are a teaspoon of non-lethal poison injected into sugary cakes. Prayers are a one size fits all set of sweet nothings used in extreme situations. Hearts are recyclable red valentines you send virtually to people who knew the victim. Grief is an incurable disease that afflicts others. Always make sure to act sympathetic. Remember to combine words such as heartfelt, sympathy, and suffering. Remember to say, I understand whenever possible in the shortest amount of space. Try to act like whatever affliction you are responding to isn't normal and commonplace. You might need to point out that the Chinese don't have words for pain and anguish. You should not explain that this is why they are inscrutable and a complete mystery. The Chinese might have other words for grief, but all of them are unpronounceable. When you send a prayer, make sure none of the words are visible to nosy reporters. Condolences are an oversized envelope in which you, in which you, into which you cram all sorts of knickknacks. Prayers do not need to be memorized since you don't have to say them aloud. Tell everyone the Bible is your favorite book, but don't say which part you like best. The Congressman's Explanation. If you live in your car, I don't have to worry about you not being able to pay rent. If you eat scraps from a dumpster, I don't have to worry about you stealing food. You don't deserve to put your miserable mouth and fumble with your rotting teeth. If you find temporary employment in a warehouse so big that no one remembers your name, I don't have to worry about you thinking your life is shit. Others with name tags will help you reach that conclusion. And if they have any brains sitting fat inside their misshapen skulls, they will inform you that you should have been left out in the rain because you didn't say for a rainy day, it's the American way. Everyone gets what they merit. You got here on your own, didn't you? Is it my fault that you failed miserably at being human, that you became another blossoming eyesore on the scrubbed face of this great nation. There's a good reason that you were drubbed and you know deep in your worm riddled heart that you got what you earned. If you live in your car, I don't have to worry about where you'll sleep at night. If you live in your car, I won't have to concern myself with where you'll be found once you are dead. Another petty thought that takes up too much of my precious day when I have the untrammeled happiness of my constituents to think about. If you live in your car, I don't have to worry about the next election because you'll be gone one way or another. So this is called the President's Telegram. It was based on something the President said on February 14, 2018. No child or teacher should ever feel terrible in an American school. My prayers should feel safe to the victims of a terrible child. My condolences to the families of anyone else. Should anyone feel unsafe in school? My condolences. Should anyone feel unsafe in a family? My prayers. Should anyone, ever, should anyone else ever feel unsafe? My prayers and condolences. Should my prayers feel unsafe? My condolences to the terrible school unsafe child and unsafe teacher feel my prayers <coughs> um, the next uh two or three poems let me see sorry next three <coughs> are from a series called the philosopher uh, the philosopher one he sacrificed uh Hope you can see me. I don't know that that's necessary. The 
philosopher one. He sacrificed the vulgar prizes of life, but his eyes danced with velvet spleen. He threw out phases, phrases of ill-tempered humor, but tread the path of primrose dalliance. He was often empty of thought, but remained entangled in paradox. He gave away his youth by the handful, but hurrying thoughts clamored for utterance. He was profoundly skeptical, but utterly detached from any sign of obstinacy. He went hot and cold, but would fall into the blackest melancholies. He writhed with impotent, impotent humiliation, but his blank gaze chilled you. He smiled with fatuous superiority, but was often stunned and uncomprehending. He made a loathsome object, but was afflicted with high levels of mental depletion. He delivered a series of monosyllabic replies, but parts of them throbbed recklessly. The philosopher four. He had become a red scalp cloud hanging motionless in the sky. He grew contemptuously indifferent to the logic of public opinion. He knew his best thoughts were covered with rare vegetation. He was stuck between formless verbosity and passionless rhetoric. He refused to be jaded by his extravagant gastronomical exertions. He felt an unaccountable loathing at his need to toss off ill-humored phrases. He did not want to fall prey to listless uneasiness or eager hopefulness. He was afraid he was a filament in a sea captain's hostile imagination. He expressed, he expressed surprise by becoming a comical and deferential satyr. He would never again be a poet walking in a valley populated by shadows. And this is the philosopher five. He's an apostle of scorn. His dilapidations have started shaping his recent outbursts. He has not always been deficient in the impulses that we call affectionate or tender. He claims he can convince his audience by flashing an extremely contemptuous veneer. He rejects all charges of incompetence by affirming that he was once afflicted by shyness. He likes to exaggerate his gallantry by adopting a tone of unexpected surprise. He might be a poor dissembler and ludicrously wrong, but his humor is not abominable. He's overjoyed to the point of tears when he hears himself being quoted by a stranger. He likes to disarm his enemies by comparing himself to a fire hydrant. He feels this to his advantage to remain in prison in a circle of mortification. He confesses to wandering in a mist, in a mist of vegetal memories whenever the mood suits him. Uh, this is a pantoum, specific form which every line repeats itself. I wrote uh, a number of them based on interviews with painters that I read or things they said to me that were printed. A painter's thoughts. This is three and it's after Susan Fricone. So everything in the poem is something that she said. All decisions are made for visual reasons. The cathedral is finally anonymous, made of multiple dimensions that go on and on. Even the sky temporarily recedes. I wish to strengthen the painting, make it exist, so that we will want to keep looking. When I traveled, I observed the vast range of red earths in the land and architecture, made of multiple, multiple dimensions that go on and on. Even the sky temporarily recedes. Red earth must be my, <clears throat> red earth has been used throughout time. There are dots and handprints in caves. When I traveled, I observed the vast range of red earths in the land and architecture. My daughter, the poet, was reading excerpts from a Chinese poem over the phone. Red earth has been used throughout time. There are dots and handprints in caves. I think they are most successful when you can't say they look like something. 
My daughter, the poet, was reading excerpts from a Chinese poem over the phone. I would love it if I could capture something comparable in my paintings. I think they're most successful when you can't say they look like something. I grew up on an, in an orchard. I was eating plums and the colors stayed in my mind. I would love it if I could capture something comparable in my paintings. All decisions are made for visual reasons. The cathedral is finally anonymous. I grew up on an orchard. I was eating plums and the colors stayed in my mind. I wish to strengthen the painting, make it exist so that we will want to keep looking. Case of mistaken identity. This is a prose poem. There's going to be a few short. They're all short. Case of mistaken identity. I told the uniformed kangaroos they had the wrong man and they agreed and let me go. This kind of thing happens to me often, being mistaken for someone else. The kangaroos, who are notoriously nearsighted, were not sure if they had apprehended the right man, a petty criminal, a poor hapless soul, possibly a dishwasher, or in my case, a white-haired poet known to walk around the city at night in search of the perfect pairing of cupcakes and congee. I told them who I was and what I did, and they believed me because they had never heard such a story before. I wondered what story I would tell the next officers I met. It's best to keep changing your tune when you're in a different circumstance. By the time I climbed the five flights to my apartment, I was another person, a decorated infantryman who had come back to the street he grew up on and was shunned by his family and neighbors because the glories of war no longer had the meanings they once broadcast. After a few months, I moved away and once again changed my name. I lived in a state ending with X and learned to do things with my hands that I did not think was possible. I also learned to fly and went to parties. I stood in the corner and made mental notes, starting with amesis and ending with snivelard. I began telling everyone how I rated his or her sense of humor on a scale of one to 10. Being a strict grader, I made fewer and fewer friends. In the meantime, I was run over by a car, a freckled boy on a bicycle, and a pilot who wondered why I was lying in the middle of the runway. I raised dachshunds, but did not see them kitchen scraps, as one future biographer will later claim. Joined to an outmoded battery, I began sparking in the middle of the night until the neighbors decided I should move to another part of town where this kind of behavior was tolerated and even embraced, and I did. This is why I told the police officers they had the wrong man. They were looking for a man who had tried to rob an ATM, not a man who thought he should have been born in a deeper fog. Latest weather report. We joined the Bug House Battalion of the Last Salvation Army, climb aboard the purring trucks and head for the valley where the fires still range. Death rides with Sidus in an air-conditioned limous limousine, a big green grin sewn crudely to its otherwise flawless face. The next morning, we stop on a mall to obtain extra rounds of supplies. We're headed for the hollow space on the map from which we are said to have emerged complete and in ruins. The parking lot is full of empty ambulances and crawling with examples of suburban loneliness. We back away from anyone who shows something resembling a face, knowing it's the residue of plastic surgery. In the rubble lots we pass, children are busy pulling handfuls of stuffing from armchairs and depositing them in color-coded plastic buckets. Their, their motto, no waste shall go to waste. This is the economy we have adjusted to, living on what the rich have used and found disagreeable. We buy only the designated essentials, wizened apples marked by star-like bruises and other signs of holiness. Domestic animals had been injected with preservatives at the moment of their genital illumination. 
fish bowls full of earthworms, blank dresses and shirts, window sills to climb over. Those who fail the daily quiz are relieved in their maps. Other than hand signals, most communication takes place at night when we can send ants across each other's skin, their six legs tapping out messages. We were taking turns recounting the plots of android versus zombie movies shortly before dawn stopped and didn't cross the horizon. We got up and began driving. The mall is a memory fading in a mirror, a relic whose function is no longer apparent. Death's grin continues spreading across his face. New reports are being received all the time. The sun can't be found, but we remain convinced it hasn't gone far. Hotel Jane Alice Peters. I like sitting in hotel lobbies that are as big as the apse of the cathedral and strung with Christmas lights. I like it when my posterior sinks into the cushion provided by the hotel management for exactly this encounter between lower extremity and nuanced comfort. I like letting my spine and all the flesh that surrounds it fall back into the carefully rounded, slightly tilting support that's attached to an elevated pairing of horizontal cushions that rest securely on four elegantly turned legs. I like the silver claws that form the tree's feet. I like knowing the architecture of this assembly was constructed with human ease in mind. I like pretending that I belong in a lobby festooned with polished brass fixings reminiscent of another era or framed by fluted marble columns hearkening, hearkening back to an even earlier era. I like knowing I can travel back in time. This is when I start replaying my favorite interlude, when I begin dreaming of meeting Carol Lombard, who died in a plane crash in Mount Potosi, Nevada, age 33. This happened on January 16, 1942. Today's January 17, 2019, more than 75 years later. Is there a hotel in Mount Potosi? Is it named after Lombard, third wife of Clark Gable? I like burrowing inside the extinct topography resurrected by young hotel designers, their manufactured version of our collective longing. I like their efforts to harness the barely controllable desire we have to step away from the time we inhabit into a hologram sector that has not been overrun by apocalyptic data. I like knowing that the scar a car accident left on Lombard's face could not be completely erased and that we can see its trace on her cheek like a horizon line when the camera closing is, closes in as in Hands Across the Table, 1935, co-starring the charmless Fred McMurray. I like knowing that she did not want to simper prettily or scream in terror on the screen. I like knowing that the E was added onto her name by mistake and that she decided to keep it. I like knowing she took life as it came, even if I'm not of that ilk and do not want to go down that torturous path. The American Way. Getting old in America is a laughable achievement. Everyone gets to laugh at you. Dying young is worse. Everyone pretends to cry secretly happy that you won't block the rise of society's ladder. Untitled Hotel. The blue moon is not untitled hotel. The blue moon is not quivering. I am of heavenly flowers planted, fall and stick, sins or sense. What does time matter now that I have so little left in which to dream? Tangled as I am, I do not want to leave in flame quagmire illuminating, illuminating my brief stay. So much of it spent dreaming of you. I have in my own eyes become laughable to think my thinking matters a wit in this wind. Living in a hotel room only I have a key to. Not even the owners know that I'm here. Dwelling on outskirts of town, I'm not a stranger to my own thoughts. 
There's no footage to save, no photographs, certainly not the clump of dust I am to become. I'll read uh, two more, three more. Why I am still a poet. I've never worn pantaloons and a tricon hat to a poetry reading. I've never claimed to embrace multitudes or platitudes. I've never had my name on an A-list, even as an alternate. I've never shared photographs of myself with my head shaved. I do not do handstands to prove I could still get it up. I do not teach creative writing in a prestigious program. I do not write about the woes that befall me and make my suffering special. I did not perform a weather report to prove my avant-garde credentials. I do, not, I do not serve up saccharine dollops that would make a goldfish vomit. I did not stand on the piazza and declare that I was a lunatic comet or failed comic. I did not compare my mother to the moon gnawed at by a pillar of salt. I did not press the accelerator while pointing at the stars and singing your name. I do not mind being ostracized if it means I'm like everyone else. I sit in the dark and tell jokes to my dog until night fills my window. Uh, call to prayer. I live near him. I live next door to a street mosque, so I hear them calling to prayer every morning. I somehow think that this is not the prayer they're being called to. Call to prayer. Let us cheer all the officials, the muckety mucks and know-it-alls, the city councilors, chairmen, and presidents of the board. Let us make funny faces whenever we're asked to pause and listen to one of their public announcements. Let us laugh long and heartily whenever they somberly say that they are with us, that they're sending us their heartfelt prayers, their deepest condolences, their wishes for a speedy recovery. Let us hoot like drunken owls. Let us be loud and obstreperous. Let us cackle again and again. All right, I'll read one more poem. Uh, this is, uh, I wrote a series of poems called Capella Sails to China. And this is the last poem and it's the last one in the book. Tell us sails to China. I'll go to my farm and open a huge bath in my chest and wash away the last disorders of my rumbled heart. When you grow old, you inevitably become foolish, begin making oaths to everyone's heir. Just another donkey declaiming at lunch, a man with no teeth and less hair, a wrinkled example of what you used to be. Instant food gone bad in a bag. Inside some men sits a cake and an egg, but not you. I used to tell elaborate jokes, and now I am one. The green cities of Asia await me. Thank you. That's it. I don't know what happens now. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you for that incredible reading. Um, is it okay if we have Andrew back on screen, please, as well? I'm back, Andrew. Here I am. <laughs> Rock on. Well, um, we have eight minutes left. Is Are there any questions, comments, or ideas you want to address about each other's work before we answer questions from the audience? Yeah, I'll, I'll pitch a question at John. Um, you, your press, Black Squared, publishes a lot of translations. I wonder what translation means to you. We've got a translation track uh, here at SF State where students can complete their MFA as a translator. So, you know, what do, what do you think of translation, and what what's the significance of it for you? I think it's how I discovered a lot of writers from other countries, starting when I was very young. I mean, when I was, uh, I can remember when I was 15 going to a bookstore and discovering Yukio Mishima. And 
you know, Yasunari Kawabata and suddenly seeing this whole other world that didn't exist. I mean, everyone that I knew was talking about Ernest Hemingway and S. Scott Fitzgerald, and I was literally not interested in them. I mean, I read them later, but I was like, that didn't mean anything to me. Somehow reading the books that I discovered that had been translated meant more. And it's also how I discovered, you know, French poetry, surrealism, et cetera. So I feel like it opened up a lot of worlds for me and it's remained important. Yeah, no, same here. I feel the same way. And, you know, doing German, like Carlos mentioned, um, you know, and now French, uh, it, it, you know, it, translating is really like swimming in another universe of discourse. It's like, a, it, it, it feels similar to you know, speculative fiction. You put yourself in another universe of meaning and, right. um, uh, yeah, it's cognitive estrangement uh, taken to the language level. Um, mm. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I love translation. But, you know, John, in your work, uh, both as a poet and a translator, you've made a special place for translation. And I just want to note that. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm publishing, a, I have to announce this, I'm publishing a translation that Andrew and Rose did of a text by... Um, uh, Reverend, yeah, yeah, Reverend, yeah. Reverend yeah. that he wrote mm -hmm. on uh, George Brock, and the reason I decided to publish this book is I found out about it in a footnote by in a Picasso biography by John Richardson, where he said this is the greatest thing ever written on Brock, and yeah. that Reverend D never mentions Picasso's name once. <laughs> and I immediately set out to find this book and contacted a friend of mine in France who got me a copy and mailed it to me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. No, Reverdy is a, a French poet has been well translated, but for some reason this 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 piece of writing has never been translated before. Right. So yeah, we seized that opportunity. Right. And then I translate I published the novella that John Ashbury translated, A Haunted House. But you see another, I wanted to publish sides of Reverdy that are not known in America. And that seems that's one of my goals. Mm. Awesome. Well, um, if you don't mind, we have a question for John sure. from Forrest in the chat. Those opinion sonnets are hilarious and not. You can manage to channel our opinions back on ourselves and American opinions in a way that uh, mesmerizes us when we aren't uh, recalling with some weird convulsive combination of laughter and horror. It seems <laughs> like that's one of the few trajectories that works to cut through our, at least my own, Forrest's muscular self-righteousness these days, no? Oh, thank you. That's Is that a question or a comment? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Suppose a little bit of both. Uh, I, I read a lot. I, re, I got yeah. I'm interested in things that people say and then how they how they could mean different things. And there's a lot of self righteousness going on. I mean, I'm not free of that. Believe me. And I just try to see my way through it in some way. And also, there's remarks that get made that you just kind of go, did someone actually say that? Hmm. I hear a lot of that. It's just tossed off very casually. And somehow that's what I'm trying to channel into my work. These kind of remarks that people don't really think about and make very kind of offhandedly. You know? So, yeah. yeah what are you. we working on? Uh, well, I finished my book Genghis Chan, and I think I'm starting a new book, but I have, I'm only at the beginning, so I don't know what it's going on with it. And um, then I'm writing a lot of art essays. I just, I finished a, a lot this summer, and I have quite a bunch set up now to get me through the winter. But basically, I write every day. So if I'm not writing a poem, I'm writing an art. Or sometimes I do both. Yeah, and you post your uh, art reviews in this uh, online journal called Hyper Allergic um, right. once a week. So that's that's how I know you're okay, John. Is that if you post <laughs> that weekly, you know, thing in Hyper Allergic, I know you're doing okay. Um, yeah. uh, what I'm working on is a new science fiction novel called Lunagrad, 
which is kind of a, a combination of uh, late 19th century Russian novels and um, another space opera type of premise. So how many science fiction novels have you done? Uh, well, you one, the O zero, and then right. this so one, yeah, 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 that's this it. This is your second one. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I figured you had three by now. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not that prolific uh, compared to you anyway. <laughs> I know over 40 books. I can't even write a yeah. poem a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to both of you. Really appreciate it. And thank you to the audience for stopping by and sharing your time with us. John Yao will be joined by Claudia LaRocco this Saturday night, October uh, 17th. And that's at 6 p.m. So it's one hour earlier than our usual events. And Brandon Brown will be the MC. And this will be the second event in this In Common Writer Series program, all here virtually at the Poetry Center. Uh, Saturday's event will be co-sponsored by Pro Arts Gallery and Commons in Oakland. You can register for the event on our website. Lastly, there will be a short survey that will pop up after you leave the room. So please take a few minutes to fill it out. Your feedback helps us with our funding to bring us great writers and poets and authors. And once again, thank you to our guests, Andrew Joran and John Yao. And see you all next time. Have a good night. Thank you.